Teilhard de Chardin is a philosophical bridge builder. His work went to the edges of the conceptual maps and sought to bridge between them. Between physics and biology, there is terra incognita that is usually dismissed as a highly unlikely event that just happened. And between biology and the social sciences and humanities, there is the classic nature versus culture chasm in which the two are left to operate in isolation. These are the chasms that Deschardins sets out to bridge between with his work. He seeks to create a more encompassing map that connects these various separate maps together in their correct relationships. Deschardins' work can ironically be simplified to one word, complexity. This is the force that bridges these chasms. Deschardins argues that these three domains of reality are related to each other like the members of a Russian doll. They form the three domains of the physical world, the biological world, and the thought world. The physiosphere, the biosphere, and the noosphere. The biosphere and the noosphere do not exist separately from their more fundamental domains, but are superimposed upon and coextensive with them. In this episode, we're going to look at the nature of and relationship between these three domains, and we're going to talk about what the noosphere is and why it is so important. Traditionally, physics is accustomed to two infinities, the infinitely small studied by quantum mechanics and the infinitely large studied by Einstein's relativity. But Deschardins argues that there is a third spatial infinity which he calls complexity. As it moves from the small to the larger, matter has two avenues of development. Under one set of ideal conditions, i.e. a nebula, this matter will, by process of aggregation, transform into a solar system with the birth of a star and its attending planets and moons. Under another set of ideal conditions, i.e. the surface of a planet in the Goldilocks zone, matter will, by a different process of accumulation called combination, transform into life. Just as there is a threshold at which a lot of space dust begins a cascading gravitational process that ignites the engine of a star, there is also a threshold of complexity whereby the elements of a primordial soup will go through a cascading complexification process that ignites a spark of life. Thus, Deschardins says, complexity is just another direction for the evolution of matter. In the thick soup of primordial earth, atoms combined into more and more complex molecules, which combined into amino acids, proteins, and ultimately into something that could turn the other elements around it into copies of itself. And so, reproduction was born, and the four billion year series that we and our peers in the present moment are the latest manifestations of began. This was the birth of what Deschardins calls the biosphere. The biosphere is the thin film of life that surrounds the Earth. In Deschardins' sense, it isn't just a habitable part of the planet, but it is in fact the whole crust of life that covers the Earth. This vitalized biosphere is superimposed on and coextensive with the unvitalized matter of the physiosphere. Deschardins prefers to call the inert matter pre living rather than inert. Life is not some uncanny alien happening in the universe but a fundamental property. As Deschardins puts it, life is not a peculiar anomaly sporadically flowering on matter, but an exaggeration through specially favorable circumstances of a universal cosmic property. Life is not an epiphenomenon, but the very essence of phenomenon. With the emergence of life, the biosphere spread over the whole planet and evolution pushed its various citizens in different directions. In looking at the tree of life that has evolved out of this initial vitalization, we can see that some organisms have increased in complexity more than others. Some branches have found stable forms of evolution as single-celled organisms, while others have continued to transform and diversify. Deschardins argues that if we are looking for the life force of complexity, we should seek it in these longer branches on the tree of life. With that in mind, he identifies three particular shoots that are the most vital. The plants, the arthropods, i.e. insects and spiders, and the vertebrates, i.e. mammals, reptiles, and so on. 
the evolution and diversification of the biosphere continued on much as it had begun, but around 2 million years ago in the east of Africa, something new began to occur whose significance can only be compared with the emergence of life itself. This is the emergence of the new sphere. Our ancestors in the genus Homo crossed what De Chardon calls the threshold of reflection. Consciousness was no longer reactive to its environment, but began to fold in on itself. In a wave of evolutions of which we sapiens were the final movement, a whole new domain of complexity began to emerge. Just as life and the biosphere signified the breaking through of a ceiling, the same can be said for the new sphere. It represents a whole new realm of evolution. This domain is cultural evolution. From the musical instruments of the Neanderthals and the tools of the Denisovans to the invention of the internet by sapiens, the new sphere represented a whole new sphere of evolution. Where the biosphere was limited to the steady process of chromosomal heredity, with the new sphere we see the emergence of acquired heredity. It is no longer a genetic inheritance relying on chromosomes alone, but a cultural inheritance of everything that your ancestors knew. This process still had something of a bottleneck constraint in it due to the limitations of the human memory. But with the advent of writing, this cultural evolution took on an exponential growth. But it wasn't just a new method of evolution. It was a whole new life form that was evolving. Deschardins notes that the evolution of the new sphere isn't just the evolution of humanity, but of our thoughts and our ideas. We can map this over onto Richard Dawkins' work on memetics and say that the new sphere was the birth of a whole new order of life. One could argue that humanity is merely the substrate of the new sphere, just as the matter of the physiosphere is the substrate of life. We are the medium through which the ideas travel and propagate and compete. One could argue that a more appropriate name for the new sphere would be the meme sphere. For while thinking and mind are core structural components of this new sphere of evolution, the actual life forms are the memes themselves. Humanity might be compared to the inert matter transformed by the biosphere. We are not the agents of the new evolution, but the raw material, the carriers of a whole new realm of evolution that is working itself out through us. Having talked about what this new sphere or meme sphere is, let's talk about where it is heading. Deschardins identifies one of the core properties of life and complexity as its knitting together of a certain number of elements upon itself. Another way that Deschardins talks about this is as a folding back on itself. When humanity first emerged from Africa, it spread over the globe. When it finally reached the tip of South America, the new sphere now encircled the globe, but the new sphere was disconnected. The connection between the various elements of the new sphere was slow. There was massive latency. Innovation could only occur with the arrival of a new wave of humans, usually as conquerors or with the reorganization of the old wave. Just as life emerged out of an increasingly dense primordial soup, so the innovations in human organization emerged out of the areas with a higher population, or what Deschardins calls psychic temperature. In the river valley civilizations of China, India, Egypt, and most significantly of all, Sumeria, we see hunter-gathering tribes give way to villages, then towns, cities, nations, and empires. The crop yields afforded by their fortuitous position led to increased population, and with that, a need for greater organization of their society. Where the chief, shaman, or elders could speak directly with the members of the tribe, a greater organization had to be formed where a king might never see one of its subjects, and yet where they were each said to have their role in the society. The critical invention in bridging this gap was writing which enabled the scaling of communication and which we can see emerge independently in at least three of the four river valley civilizations. This innovation had a major cascading effect in the self-enfolding of the new sphere. Until the modern era, writing was the cutting edge of this self-enfolding, but with the increase in population density once again, there came an increased need for organization 
and an increased self-enfolding of the new sphere. In the past century and a half, the world population has increased five times over. And with that, we've seen the emergence of the telephone, radio, television, and most recently, the internet and social media. And now we are staring down the barrel of computer brain interfaces that would connect us directly into a hive mind. The increasing population, whether by cause or effect, brings with it the need for increased organization of the new sphere. The knitting together upon itself of the new sphere seems to be reaching a fevered pitch comparable to the threshold of reflection in East Africa or the point of vitalization in the primordial soup billions of years ago. The compression of the new sphere is far from news to us today, but the question of the desirability of this endpoint is still a matter of heated debate. On the pessimistic side, we have Star Trek's great brain computer hive mind, the Borg, dystopian portrayals of AI, and fears of an insect-like humanity that we see in the likes of H.G. Wells' novel, The First Men in the Moon. On the optimistic side, we have the rapture of the nerds that we call the Singularity, and Deschardins himself. Deschardins saw this final and total compression of the new sphere as the bridging point between religion and science. This is the omega point, where the new sphere compresses into one point just as the Big Bang was originally one primordial atom. It is the complementary endpoint to mirror the Big Bang's starting point. It is the meaning of the universe and the birth of God. However we feel about the future of this process, the reason why I find Deschardins' work so important is that it speaks to many of the dynamics in our society. It gives us a frame whereby we can situate man's place in nature and biology's place in the physical world. It offers us a holistic vision of the sciences while also offering us a novel frame through which to look at the problems arising out of social media and globalization, as well as the climate crisis. There is a thrust of complexity driving us forward that is far more fundamental than any individual human's greedy appetite. There is a will to compression, to bring this folding in on itself that is the hallmark of complexity to its final degree. That's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. I'd like to thank Shane, Croissant Eater, and all the other patrons for their support of the channel. If you'd like to get access to weekly bonus episodes, monthly Q&As, and to get your name in the credits like these wonderful people, you can head over to Patreon. As ever, if you have any thoughts, insights, or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.